And that night I went to bed and I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't breathe, which was a very scary experience. Hey folks, how's it going? I am very excited to share today's lesson with Ollie from I Will Teach You a Language. Ollie speaks eight languages fluently. And in today's lesson, you will hear a story about how a near death experience helped him to learn Spanish. And if you are new here, every week we help you to understand fast speaking natives without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. Just like Khadija, who says that they never get bored with our lessons and now they can speak English confidently. We want to help you on your learning journey too, but we can only do that if you hit that subscribe button and the bell down below so that you don't miss any new lessons. So just to start off, I think there's quite an interesting story that we had seen. So I was wondering if you could tell the audience about your near death experience. Yeah. So this was when I almost died. It was about 15 years ago. And um, I tell this story to, uh, to, to explain how I learned really good Spanish. Because before this happened, I was learning Spanish, but I, I found it very difficult. And this experience happened and uh, it really changed how I learned Spanish. So I was traveling in Argentina um, and this was, uh, I think in 2003, and I was traveling up to the north of the country, up on the border with Bolivia. And um, it was this beautiful little village up in the mountains called Irusha. And it was very, very high up. And I was uh, with some friends and we had a, we'd enjoyed like a really nice steak and a bottle of red wine. And, and that night I went to bed and I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't breathe, which was a very scary experience. I don't know if you've ever had this happen very high up in the mountains, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So I kind of jumped out of bed and um, didn't know what to do. So I kind of ran outside onto the balcony and I remember standing on this big balcony looking out over this huge valley with a full moon shining light down across the whole valley. It was a very surreal experience. And I couldn't breathe, the breath wasn't coming back. And I think about two or three minutes passed and I still couldn't breathe. And I was you know, trying to breathe as, as heavily as I could. And I, I thought then, you know, this is it. I'm gonna die on top of this mountain. Um, luckily, the breath came back and, and I was okay in the end. Uh, but I was very scared from what happened. So I sat down outside and I was too scared to go back to bed. And so all I had with me to pass the time, because we didn't have iPhones back then, all I had with me was a Spanish book that I bought from a local bookshop. And it was, it was far too difficult for me. I remember it was Crónica de una Muerte Anunciada by García Márquez. It was too difficult for me, but I didn't have anything else to do. So I started reading this book in Spanish, like plodding through the pages one by one. Didn't really understand most of it, but some bits I could understand. But I was too scared to go back to bed. So I kept on reading. And I must have been reading this book for about three hours or so before I eventually fell asleep. All right. So now we're going to learn all the most difficult vocabulary and pronunciation from this clip. But I want to let you know that the clips that you're watching today are just an excerpt from my full interview with Ollie on the Beyond Borders talk show. You can listen to it for free right now. Just click the link in the description. And now grab a pen and paper and let's get ready to learn. So just to start off, I think there's quite an interesting story that we had seen. So I was wondering if you could tell the audience about your near-death experience. You probably are familiar with each of these words when you look at them separately. However, sometimes, in order to improve your vocabulary, you don't need to learn new words, but rather learn new ways to combine words you already know in new collocations. In the most basic meaning, near means a short distance away as in, he lives near London. In a more advanced use of this word, you can use it to mean almost doing something or almost in a particular state. You can say, the work is near completion, or in its adverb form, it is nearly done. Another example is, he was near tears. 
As Ollie said next, a near-death experience is one in which you almost die, but you don't. We usually associate these with a big realization or epiphany. And I was traveling up to the north of the country, up on the border with Bolivia. And um, it was this beautiful little village up in the mountains called Irusha. And Notice how Ollie uses the adverb up to describe some actions that happen in the north of the area he's talking about. In this case, in the country of Argentina. Here's a similar example. We're driving up to San Francisco for the conference. We use down in the same way. They live down south in a small village. Ollie says he was staying in a small town up on the border with Bolivia. Do you know what that means? Village, limit, capital. And it was very, very high up. And I was uh, with some friends and we had a, we'd enjoyed like a really nice steak and a bottle of red wine and... There's a good deal of connected speech in this sentence. As you can notice, he doesn't fully enunciate each sound in these words, simply because it isn't necessary. So he reduced anda to anna. Then bottle of becomes bottle of. Like a really nice steak and a bottle of red wine and like a really nice steak and a bottle of red wine and... And that night I went to bed and I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't breathe. Once again here, Ollie links and reduces some of his words in this sentence. We have three function words here, and so all four words link together. There's more reduction in the second part of this utterance. He doesn't say this like, at about three o'clock in the morning. Rather, he goes, And I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't. And I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't. Do you ever feel frustrated when you can't understand natives? We don't always speak like you expect us to, right? Like you learned in school? That is exactly why we created our Fluent with Friends course to teach you how natives really speak so that you never feel lost again. And you will have so much fun because you will learn how to do it with friends, which many academic studies show is the best TV series to learn English. So what are you waiting for? You can try it for free right now with our three part masterclass. Just click here or in the description below to learn more and sign up. So I kind of jumped out of bed and um, didn't know what to do, so I kind of ran outside onto the balcony. And I remember standing on this big balcony. A balcony is a structure like this on a house or a building that has more than one story. Also notice his use of the preposition onto. Like into or upon, this is a preposition of movement and it's important for meaning. Let's take the preposition into and think about these two sentences. He ran in the house. He ran into the house. The first sentence means that he ran inside the house. The second sentence means that he was outside and he entered the house, running. Looking out over this huge valley with a full moon shining light down across the whole valley. It was a... If something shines, it produces a bright light. For example, the sun and the moon shine light. Do you know what we call the light that comes from the sun? It's sunshine. You might go down to Cornwall, which is very beautiful. I haven't visited, but it's got nice beaches. It's very beautiful, but you, you're not guaranteed sunshine or good weather. Mm. So people will travel to other parts of Europe, especially for their summer holiday by the beach with lots of sun. It was a very surreal experience and I couldn't breathe. The breath wasn't coming back. Surreal refers to a situation or experience that is very strange and difficult to understand, like something from a dream. Example, the train ride through the mountains was truly surreal. And I, I thought then, you know, this is it. I'm going to die on top of this mountain. Ollie uses the expression, this is it, in relation to the moments before death. We also use it to say that an important thing is about to be done. Here are some examples. Uh, yeah, I remember the Very first understandable. time I got my, uh, my plane ticket to go to France. Mm -hmm. I felt like, maybe this was a little too overly ambitious, but I felt like when I bought that ticket, I thought, this is it. 
I'm fluent in French right now. I got it. I got my <laughs> ticket. This is the ticket. You come to most parts of Europe and it's like, you know, toast with jam or a cookie or a croissant or something like that. And you're like, this, this is it. I need, to, I need more. I need some protein. All I had with me was a Spanish book that I bought from a local bookshop. And it was, it was far too difficult. We already saw the basic meaning of near and a more advanced use of that word. Far is the opposite of near. And you can also use it in a more advanced way to emphasize another word as in, I ate far too much and now my stomach hurts. Here's another example. And that means that I am careful with my money and I spend far less than what I make, you know? Like, and I do this by having a budget and, you know, I record everything that I spend <laughs> just to live within I do my the means, same. right? Yeah. It makes so I started reading this book in Spanish, like plodding through the pages one by one. If you plod through something, you continue to make progress through it with effort at a slow but consistent pace. Example, I'm still plodding through the applications we got, but I should get finished soon. Anyway, next day I was walking through the village, happy to be alive, and I realized that there were all these words that kept popping into my head, these Spanish words like el obispo, which is not a word that you use, that you learn normally in textbooks, it means the, the bishop, el obispo. And there were all these words like this popping into my head. I thought, well, that's strange, because normally when I try to l memorize new words, it's very difficult. I can't remember them <laughs> for very long. But these words were, were lodged in my head. And I realized, well, it's because I was reading that book last night. And so I carried on reading and I finished the book. It was difficult for me, but it was just enough to understand. And then um, two or three weeks later, I went back to Buenos Aires where I was staying to see my friends. And I realized suddenly I could speak Spanish so much more fluently. I was speaking in longer sentences. I had more vocabulary. I could understand what people were saying to me. And I realized it was all because I'd started to read this book in Spanish. And so all of the kind of study that I'd done mm -hmm. before that suddenly came together and and created a complete view of the of the language uh, in my mind. And so that's how I sort of discovered for myself the power of learning with stories. Yeah. And that's even stuck with you. I mean saying like yeah. El Obispo, that it's like a very obscure Twenty years later word. I still remember it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's very crazy. Anyway, next day I was walking through the village, happy to be alive, and I realized that there were all these words that kept popping into my head, these Spanish. If you say that something keeps happening, it happens many times or continues to happen. For example, I was reading the Chronicles of Narnia in French and they kept saying one word, epe. I'm like, what is epe? I don't know, they keep saying it. Vanessa is another amazing English teacher. And I also had the pleasure to interview her on Beyond Borders. After you finish this video, I recommend that you check out the lesson with her where you will get five tips to improve your English speaking now. You can find that linked up here and in the description down below. Ali here says that words kept popping in his head. We say this when we start to think about something. Perfect. So does this at all make you think about Justin Timberlake? That's the first thing that popped into my head is that that song. I was just going to say the same thing. I've got it in my <laughs> head now. I'm just like singing it. It's such a great song and a really great video as well with Scarlett Johansson. I can't remember them for very long, but these words were lodged in my head. If something is lodged somewhere, it is firmly stuck. To lodge something means to make something become stuck. Example, the poor kid got his head lodged between the rails. And I realized, well, it's because I was reading that book last night. And so I carried on reading and I finished the book. It was difficult for me, but it was just enough to understand. Carry on is a phrasal verb used to mean to continue doing something. It's more common in British English. Example, sorry I interrupted you, please carry on. And that's even stuck with you. I mean, saying like, yeah. el obispo, that it's like a very obscure 20 years later, word. I still remember it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's very crazy. If something sticks, you remember it. We also often say it like, it stuck with me. Example, the things my grandma taught me as a kid stuck with me. Obscure means not well known and is usually not very important. Here, I mean that obispo is a word that's not part of everyday Spanish. Doing great so far. Now, get ready for a challenge. 
We're going to test everything you learned by watching both clips without subtitles and answering some quiz questions. And if you've enjoyed this lesson, remember the full interview with Ollie is available for free. It's linked in the description down below. So just to start off, I think there's quite an interesting story that we had seen. So I was wondering if you could tell the audience about your near death experience. Yeah. So this was when I almost died. It was about 15 years ago. And um, I tell this story to, uh, to, to explain how I learned really good Spanish. Because before this happened, I was learning Spanish, but I, I found it very difficult. And this experience happened and uh, it really changed how I learned Spanish. So I was traveling in Argentina um, and this was, uh, I think in 2003, and I was traveling up to the north of the country, up on the border with Bolivia. And um, it was this beautiful little village up in the mountains called Irusha. And it was very, very high up. And I was uh, with some friends and we had a, we'd enjoyed like a really nice steak and a bottle of red wine. And, and that night I went to bed and I woke up at about three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't breathe, which was a very scary experience. I don't know if you've ever had this happen very high up in the mountains, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So I kind of jumped out of bed and um, didn't know what to do. So I kind of ran outside onto the balcony. And I remember standing on this big balcony looking out over this huge valley with a full moon shining light down across the whole valley. It was a very surreal experience. And I couldn't breathe, the breath wasn't coming back. And I think about two or three minutes passed and I still couldn't breathe. And I was you know, trying to breathe as, as heavily as I could. And I, I thought then, you know, this is it. I'm going to die on top of this mountain. Um, luckily, the breath came back and, and I was okay in the end. Uh, but I was very scared from what happened. So I sat down outside and I was too scared to go back to bed. And so all I had with me to pass the time, because we didn't have iPhones back then, all I had with me was a Spanish book that I bought from a local bookshop. And it was, it was far too difficult for me. I remember it was Crónica de una Muerte Anunciada by García Márquez. It was mm -hmm. too difficult for me, but I didn't have anything else to do. So I started reading this book in Spanish, like plodding through the pages one by one. Didn't really understand most of it, but some bits I could understand. But I was too scared to go back to bed. So I kept on reading. And I must have been reading this book for about three hours or so before I eventually fell asleep. Anyway... Next day, I was walking through the village, happy to be alive, and I realized that there were all these words that kept popping into my head, these Spanish words like el obispo. Which is not a word that you use, that you learn normally in textbooks, I mean, the, the bishop. El obispo. And there were all these words like this popping into my head. I thought, well, that's strange because normally when I try to l memorize new words, it's very difficult. I can't remember them <laughs> for very long. But these words were, were lodged in my head. And I realized, well, it's because I was reading that book last night. And so I carried on reading and I finished the book. It was difficult for me, but it was just enough to understand. And then um, two or three weeks later, I went back to Buenos Aires where I was staying to see my friends. And I realized suddenly I could speak Spanish so much more fluently. I was speaking in longer sentences. I had more vocabulary. I could understand what people were saying to me. And I realized it was all because I'd started to read this book in Spanish. And so all of the kind of study that I'd done mm -hmm. before that suddenly came together and, and created a complete view of the, of the language uh, in my mind. And so that's how I sort of discovered for myself the power of learning with stories. Yeah. And that's even stuck with you. I mean, saying like yeah. El Obispo, that it's like a very obscure 20 years later, word. I still remember it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's very crazy. I was really dedicated to learn, so I did a lot of studying, but I was 
doing the wrong thing, like doing the workbooks and doing the grammar. And it wasn't right. really until I moved to the US where my Spanish went from, I'd say again, yeah, A2 to uh, a B2. Um, it's probably regressed a little bit since then. 